Bienvenidos a todos and welcome back to another episode of In El Barrio, where we showcase different Latine and Latina owned businesses in the DFW, really doing the, the dang thing. And we have to do a shout out to obviously Dallas ISD for featuring with us during this series. You know, 97.9 would be nothing without a community, but also I have to make sure that we know who the real G's are in the Latine movement. And uh, just so you know, real G's move in silence. So <laughs> our next guest uh, is definitely one of those. For the last 18 years, he has been an artist, graphic designer, illustrator, but also a pioneer for culture curation of Dallas as itself. I'm talking through his personal brand, Dummy Fresh, where he makes sure we say the freshest there is. Also to some of his biggest murals that are our actual favorites all the way from Texas to Kansas. Even more, he has some branding behind some of our top favorite restaurants and chains like <clears throat> a little La La Land here and there, a little Chilangos here and there. He even has his own fonts, not one, but two fonts. And he has courses on how to do calligraphy. Y'all might also know he's worked with some amazing sports teams like our Dallas Cowboys, the Dallas Mavericks, and many other specialty public projects like the RP Mamba Movement, WrestleMania, and being one of the best uncles there is because, yes, his nephew is a part of the movement too. He is a brother, a son, and truly a powerhouse for the Latino community. Everybody, welcome. Agustin Chavez, welcome. Hi. Hello, hi. hi. How you doing? <laughs> Beautiful. I'm so happy to have you here. I've been like bothering you for so long just because I know normally you prefer to be behind the scenes. So first and foremost, thank you for giving an exclusive opportunity to kind of get a little bit more knowledge behind you. Um, I know, again, you're part of our the last 18 years. You've actually been from the clubs with us to our billboards to, again, the stuff that we wear. So for me, I always like to ask people how did we get here? So it always starts with the roots. And I always like to focus in on where do you feel like your movement has happened? Like your family, are they from Dallas? Like, how did that work out for you? Um, so I was born in Mexico, um, Allende, Nuevo Leon. But I think it started early. You know, um, it's just one of those things. Every, every kid draws when they're little. It's just, I just kept continue. I continue to keep on drawing. Um, I think I knew that I was good at it. When I was like in elementary, um, my teacher like they gave us a project, and I she thought I did like like outstanding, I guess. And she was like, "We need to call your parents. Like, this is like not normal. This is looks better than what it should be. Like, we, we need to talk to you." And then I from there, it. and from there, I kind of it kind of like stuck to me, and it mm -hmm. was in my head like, "Okay, I I could do something," you know, like, and it, it was just kind of practice over and over, just continuing to draw and be creative and just kind of like always wanting to get that feeling that that teacher showed me yes. like when she was like oh my god like I kind of like it was like I want to see that again and again and again yes absolutely Wait, so are is anybody in your family artists like in Mexico where y'all because you know Mexico is full of artisans specifically like we are very specific of how we do stuff so yeah um, for in my family I think I'm the first one that was actually like into the art and really made a career of it um and a passion for it yes. i do have cousins and that are younger than me that um, i don't know if i was an inspiration to them but but you know they i kept uh, one of them under my wings and he's a really good artist as well beautiful beautiful okay so about how old were you whenever uh you were kind of first introduced to taking it seriously for artistry i was 13 years old when i um I used to go to the mall and I used to see like them airbrushing shirts. Yes. So then I was like, oh, that's cool. Like I, I like the decoration, you know, and I would go every weekend and there was a guy there and he would see us and he's like, oh, if, you know, if you have any questions, just let us, let me know. Yes. Um, so even from him, him taking us under his wing, it kind of like spiraled into like what it became. But like just a little backstory um, for Christmas, we were going to Mexico and I told my parents, I want a compressor, I want an airbrush, and I want some t-shirts. And I know where they sell this airbrush paint. Like, I want to make my own shirts. Yes. And they were like, okay. So they bought all, my, all the stuff. And then we left to Mexico. And I was like, when do I get to use it? You know, <laughs> so I have to wait to come back. Um, but then it, it's one of those things. It's it's new. It's new territory. I thought it was easy. I started using it. And I was like, okay, this is harder than I thought. Yeah. So I gave up. 
you know but i would do a couple shirts and i gave up and then i was like i'd wait like two months and i'd be like i'm gonna try it again because the last time i learned something but maybe i'll learn something again this time yeah. and it, it was a on and off for like a year um before i went to high school and then when i got to high school i started selling the shirts i made this binder i had like my teachers even would let me at the last 30 minutes 15 minutes of class they would be like okay you can pass your binder because i was charging like seven dollars for anything you want in a shirt just so i can get the work you know what i'm saying the practice I love yes yeah. hat change hat change wait a minute for this occasion we gotta okay oh. okay not to stun on y'all but i'm gonna go through them okay call me ray j because i got options okay <laughs> so with that um that's a business you started a business then essentially at 14 15. that yeah, was when your oh. in entrepreneurship journey really really took off did you because i heard through the grapevine that you was you ended up being at the bazaar and you were like the preferred person yeah. doing so, airbrush so how did that work four years were basically practiced from in all high school when i graduated me and one of my homies was we were like hey you know let's open up a store you know like we can make money off of this i remember the first month we made like i think it was like 350 bucks and our rent was like 250 wow. so we had a hundred dollars profit and we're like you know we can make money and the next going? month it was like 500 and the next month it was like seven you know and it just kept increasing and they were like we were like okay this is gonna work like this is this is we can make some money but you know um from there we were like okay let's expand a little we went to the bazaar um and i mean we just airbrushed as a passion as a hobby you know we were doing something that we love doing we we're hanging out with our friends nobody was telling us what time to get there mm -hmm. um i didn't have my first job till i was about 25. Wow. so like like working for somebody i was working yeah, no, you were working for yourself yeah, yeah. so That's i didn't even know what it was um oh shit. Did, I'm still with you. I, oh you good can you I'm hear still me, with you. You hear okay, me? Okay. yeah I, I pressed the lock button oh um, no you're good you're good yeah and then um from there I, I knew this four years high school and then six years um stores bazaar i had like 10 years under my belt uh, airbrushing and then I kind of I saw it kind of slowing down so I was like okay I, there's there has to be a switch so at a young age also I knew that digital was the next the next wave and you know again it was like um going back to my parents and I was like hey you know um I'm trying to do this but I need this I need I need to buy a computer yeah. um my dad ended up buying the computer through his job and I learned how to use Photoshop and I was just put all the time that I had available to learn like these programs that I have found on this computer that I had no clue how to use, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So first that means, that means that not only are you the OG moving in silence, but that means your parents are like your silent partners. So they're like the yeah. oh, oh, geez of really yeah. like being able to keep you to, to scale the way that you have because you yeah. have, they, they believed in you and that's Definitely, huge. Yeah. So, and that kind of also leads me into, you know, at 25 is when you were like working with other people, but you also do like you've at this point, some of your biggest things have been your collaborations. Um, can you tell me how you were able to start transitioning into like, okay, I'm doing it because it's still a lost art form. And I'm sure you can still, cause especially now people don't know how to airbrush. So yeah, not a lot. I might have to, uh, I'll pay big bucks. I want a custom <laughs> dummy fresh airbrush. But, um, but how did you start that process of, you know, being an entrepreneur to finding what brands to partner with, to be able to scale up to the large, brands that we know of today and even the ones that you've helped create the type of vision they have that that's a great question um i think i never worked to work for those for those brands or for those projects mm -hmm. it was more of like i'm gonna have fun doing it and i'm just gonna see how it goes yeah along that time i was you know preparing i knew we we're a digital age you know so i made sure you know, I was on social media. I made sure I had my website. I made sure I had a portfolio. It's like all these things that um, that people were telling me like I needed to get done. I would listen to them. At this same time, you know, I'm learning and taking like courses online and getting inspired and having, you know, looking up to people, other designers. And it, it was just like I never worked. I never did this in with the end goal of like getting these partnerships and getting these collaborations. It was more yeah. about me being creative, me doing me doing what I love and, you know, and see people's reactions, you know, yes. um, eventually, you know, um, th through an email, um, I got 
you know, I think one of my first partnerships and it was just like, um, Hey, we can do this. And then it ended up being like a ghost company and it, I lost money. And then I was kind of just like, man, this, this, it was not going to happen, you know? Oh my gosh, um, yes. Yeah. So it was just kind of like, okay, keep working, keep working. Um, there's, I, I, I don't have a recollection of like, when was my first break when I got like a brand, mm -hmm. but I will say that, um, after 25 and I started working at escapade clubs, you know, I was gonna ask you about escapade. I didn't want to bring it out, but you know, we know you were part of the big movement. So yes. Yeah. So working with escapade, I even learned way more, you know, working with my boss here, um, just being around more influential people, smarter people, you know, and then learning from them. Yeah. Actually, it's like one of the one of the fun bits I have heard about you again through that. It's a long grapevine, but it's good. It's good grapevine um, <laughs> that, you know, one of the parts of I think what made you to be so successful is because, you know, during those years that people are just going out to the club and hanging out, you were at the house working on your crafts. Yeah. During out club hours, I'm going to work on this design. I'm going to figure mm -hmm. out what my font's going to be and all that kind of stuff, which I think is also speaks volumes because to even be you know, from a young age, mm -hmm. so inspired. It's, it's true, like this is a part of what your essence is and which is why it's so impactful. I think it makes sense um, when you put in those kinds of hours to get the type of responses that you get. With that yeah. being said- And that this was not at the club. This is, this, is, this is at the younger age as well. Like, you know, 15 to 15 to 18, you know, house parties. Instead yeah. of going to house parties, I was going, I was staying at home and I was learning. I was on YouTube before YouTube was, YouTube, you know, there's not a lot of tutorials. There was not a lot of people showing you stuff. Now you could probably go, you could learn anything you want on YouTube. But back then it was like, it was, it was harder, but you know, I, I still had the willpower. I still had the dedication, you know, and I knew that I had to get good and I had to go, get good quick, you know? Mm -hmm. And the only way is like putting in the time right now. And then eventually I'll see the fruits. Absolutely. And I think, for me also, with that transitioning in, with some of the fruits of your labor, there's some of those lessons. You got good days and bad days, but mm -hmm. you also get the lesson of being a small artist. Um, one thing that I know is kind of, a, uh, especially right now, where there's a lot more visibility on it, but back in the day, because you started Dummy Fresh in 2006? Yeah. So yeah, so you're right at 18 years. So right now, there's a big struggle with small artists because they are getting a lot of their personal artwork stolen mm -hmm. and other bigger brands are using it and kind of basically taking the money out of their hands. Have you ever experienced anything like that? And and how do you navigate those kinds of things? Um, it did happen um, with a couple t-shirt designs. It, it's happened now um, wow. with bigger clients. I, I can't say who they are or anything, but you know, we're, we're talking through it and see how we can fix that. But yeah, yeah definitely. Like, I feel like sometimes, People think it's just easy to, you know, take something and make it theirs. Yeah, absolutely. So for somebody, you know, who might be kind of in the process of dealing with something like that, because again, artistry, is you already sensitive about your art anyways, like mm -hmm. artists are in touch with their emotions. Like, what do you, what do you, how do you get yourself through those moments of setback, whether it be maybe a project that you're not as happy about or a project that, you know, you thought you'd be able to present yourself, but somebody else is coming to take it. Like, how do you get yourself to be able to say, okay, well, I'm going to do this instead. Or what is that process like for you to be able to brush it off and still go be successful? Because you clearly are doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think for every project that I've had, it's more of like um, reputation, you know? Um, I think at the end of the day, being able to show that you can work with these companies or these brands at, at a high level, mm -hmm. it kind of shows other brands that they can come in and trust you, you know? So... I always take it as as that, like even if the project is non-paying or I'm gonna make a little bit, it's more about the value that it's gonna bring to myself and for the future, not for right now. Right, absolutely. And speaking of, if they really wanted to, they could just come take a class because you do classes as well. Yeah. So what made you start taking those t that time to start educating people, um, specifically on the craftsmanship of you know illustration itself? Um, I think um, a lot of people want to le learn the lettering. So that, that's the classes that we teach. It's like calligraphy and lettering, not the not the calligraphy that you saw like in like awards and stuff, but the lettering that's in now that's more 
fluid and more fun, you know, um, it, it, that came up with one of two of my friends and they were like, hey, you know, we need to start, you know, showing people like what we know how to do because we get messages all the time. And it's like, hey, um, is this a font? And it's like, nah, this is all original lettering. You know, like it, it's there's you can't find these fonts. This is all, you know, hand drawn um, fonts and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, and with that being said, um, you have some of your custom personalized, your own characters, your own mm -hmm. fonts, all that kind of stuff. And in those, you've taken everywhere again from some of our favorite sports teams. And y'all see, this is a this is an Agustin exclusive. You feel me? Um, but from those to like festivals, like the Garden Asada Festival, the Kakui Fest. Um, also, again, all the way this huge murals you have like that big old wrestlemania you just finished a mural as well and yeah. all of these art forms they're kind of similar kind of different so what do you feel like is like you're that like you're good at a lot of stuff but like your true passion is it is it working with these festivals and creating that kind of stuff is it doing the murals is it doing the classes what do you think it is for you that that is that motivating factor um again for me it's always about experience um it's creating things that people want to take a picture without asking them to like it's creating these things that people want to keep in their phones and show their kids and show their grandparents. So like, Oh, look, this guy from West Dallas did this. Oh, look at this kid that grew up over here. Did this, you know, Yeah. It's, for me, it's all about excuse me, experiences. And like, even this last one that we finished with um, the Dallas stars, um, I just go and I see the tags on 7-Eleven and the Dallas Stars and it's people coming from all over the place just to take pictures because they're like, oh, we, we haven't seen a mural like this before. You know, yes. we've seen murals, but not like this one. Not like right. this one. Yes, I love that. What do you do to fine tune to keep yourself um, continuously expanding your creativity? Because, you know, a lot of times if you are usually the pioneer and the culture curator, there's not really somebody kind of like when you're trying to learn how to do all this stuff, there's not a reference point for you. So what do you think your reference point is for these inspirations? Um, I draw all my inspiration from from like growing up, you know, like all the I collect retro games. I collect like vintage um, cards and like if you look at my studio, like I collect random stuff. I collect like this is an artist from um I think he's from Italy. Like this is like random stuff that I collect. Um, but it's it's that you know it's being open minded, looking at other artists, and then taking my childhood, you know, crumbling it, bringing something out. You know. Yeah. So do you feel like you know because you said you're primarily raised here in Dallas, right? Mm -hmm. So are we saying first off, so that one teacher who inspired you, that was a DISD teacher? Yes. Shout out to DISD. Yeah. We love that. So what part of West Dallas specifically um, do you feel like, you, how, how do you incorporate that in everything you do? Because if that's part of your inspiration, where your roots are from. Yeah. So what is that? Um, I, went, <laughs> I went to Gabe, Gabe P. Allen in, in West Dallas, which is west of West Dallas, more up Singleton and Bernal. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to Thomas Edison um, for high school. I didn't go to my home school. Um, I got... I got to go to Skyline. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, but it just those two smaller schools that I went to, I think those played like a good role in kind of molding me and seeing like who I wanted to be and see who I didn't want to be around, you know, and stuff yeah. like that. Absolutely. And then it makes sense because, of course, then you they put you at over in Skyline. That's why you got your business skills down. I mean, the tact is there. You got to get your business for real. Everybody's yeah. doing there. So, that's amazing. With that being said, I'll got one last little. <laughs> For la gente, claro que sí. Um, okay, so finally, I have to, again, touching back on your roots, because as we know now, your parents are the silent partners. Um, when it comes to your relationship with them and, and as you continue to break these, honestly, like barriers, like these ceilings that they told us, because you are the epitome of what I feel like in El Barrio is about. You know, people don't realize that when they're looking at these things, they're getting these brand familiar familiarities and they have now our youth is growing up and they're seeing these symbols and these representations that they're going to, again, embed into their mind and grow off of and become better in the future. Mm -hmm. um, how has that 
been for you and your family to be able to see you truly actively becoming that representation for the whole entire city of Dallas? I mean, they're, they're super happy. I think every time I tell them, like, I have this project coming up, it's like you see their eyes glow. You see, like, oh, you know, my son is doing this. Um, it's being very proud, you know, um, my, not just my parents, it's my whole family, you know, yeah. like even seeing the hats and my family, uncle seeing my other people wear the hats. They're like, hey, I saw this guy wearing your hat. Yes. You know, like it, it's kind of like a, a, a representation of my whole family, you know, because mm -hmm. it's kind of like making them look good and then them talk good about me as well. Yes. And, and I think that's also... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, and then and then feeling very proud to to say that, oh, you know, I know this guy that you're wearing his hat, like this is my nephew, you know? It's huge. And I think again, as being a perfect representation, um, the Latino culture is very, you know, it's 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 community. And you know, when you're built up, you know, unfortunately not everybody does have such a great support system. But again, with you having such a support system as that, again, the scalings that you've been able to do thus far, it only makes sense. Um, and I mean, I'm kind of, I'm kind of nosy. I'm like, out of everything you've done, what do you feel like you're the most proud of? Everything. I don't think I can pick one thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. every, every project that I get is every project that I work on with like everything that I can give it, you know, mm -hmm. it's like whenever I got to work on the La La Land logo, yes. it was like, okay, it's a, it's a logo for a coffee shop. I never knew that it was going to get this big. You know what I'm saying? But when I'm working on it, I'm still working on it like it's, if it's a huge company, even though it was a startup, yeah. you know? Yeah. So every every project I take it on as being like the best that I can do. I love that. I, yeah, love so I don't it. have one. I don't have one single project that I was like, this is my favorite. Um, but I do have some that are like top 10. OK, give me two. Just give me two. I got to know because I'm like, it's all so good. But I have to know from your experience. So, give me two. Um, being being from Monterrey and being from Allende, Nuevo Leon, like that area, I got to design a helmet for a Mexican NASCAR driver. I think that right there Huge. was one of my favorite projects to work with because it was super hands on. Um, you know, it was it was really, really cool to see them reach out to like somebody from West Dallas, yes. like just because like I had something on my portfolio that said, that I was uh, Hispanic and I was from here, you know, and the story was great. Yes. So yes. that, I think that's one of my top 10. Um, the other one, it has to be WrestleMania. The experience after that was like super cool. Fire, honestly, yeah. yes. One thing, one, my great grandfather was from Monterrey, so we might be cousins. No, no, nothing too pressure. I'm just saying. And then on the other end, WrestleMania is crazy. So anybody who's never been to WrestleMania or been a part of that movement, it's insane. Yeah. And I honestly, I need some more juicy details of how we're gonna get how you've gotten to these places. So for the first time ever, we're gonna follow this back up. I'm gonna have you come back at the end of the month into the station so we can get you some good juicy details. Y'all make sure to tune in. I'm gonna give the exact date because I wanna make sure. Y'all are ready. I've never had an exclusive like this in studio, so I'm super excited. October 27th, it's going down, so we can get some more juicy details of some of the big brands that Agostin has created, or helped be creative anyways. And before I go, I got one last thing as well. I have a playlist. It's called Por Mis Primos. The challenge is, no matter the genre or whatever the year, every primo needs to have this song on their playlist. You got one? Um, I do. Okay. Every primo that has to have it. Every primo. Hey. Sigo siendo el rey. Come on. Yeah, Put from Vicente, Vicente Fernandez, sigo siendo el rey. Clearly, no, on it. Okay, yes, because the people who don't know, Latinos, Vicente Fernandez is literally the culture. Okay, so mm -hmm. I think that's the first one we've had on the playlist. So perfect, Claro, you're 
a classic man. So I look forward to adding it to the playlist. Y'all make sure to check in on Spotify for Mis Primos. More importantly, I appreciate your time and I look forward to us doing our first ever follow up because again, you are a mega influence, a mega house, a powerhouse. And he's so subtle and so humble about it. But like, I'm going to turn you up because you deserve it. You are truly the brand in the face of so much of Dallas. And I want the whole world to know. And I also want you to know who's tuned in. I appreciate you so much for tapping in. I'm Kirby Lozano again. And thank you to Dallas ISD for featuring the Latina Heritage Month with us right here at 97.9 The Beats. But we'll be back again with another episode right here on In El Barrio. Thank you so much. Thank you.